This episode of The Startup Life is brought to you by People Ready. Startup Nation, you have a lot on your plate. The last thing you need to stress about is finding quality staff or the available work you need to be successful. Save time and headache by working with a trusted staffing partner that meets your everyday needs. People Ready is a national staffing provider with over 600 locations across the country and 30 plus years of experience serving people just like you. They specialize in a variety of industries including retail, manufacturing, logistics, general cleaning, hospitality, construction, and more. People Ready understands that you're busy and on the go. That's where their mobile app, JobStack, comes in. Use the app to place orders or find work 24-7 or wherever you are. And as social distancing continues to change the way we interact with customers, colleagues, and our everyday lives, JobStack provides the ability to find the right temporary workers or work you need while eliminating the amount of physical touch points needed in the staffing process. Visit PeopleReady.com forward slash Startup Life to learn more about how you can partner with People Ready. This episode is sponsored by Swanson Health. Startup Nation, Swanson Health has been producing quality vitamins and supplements, foods, healthy home, and self-care products for over 50 years. Since 1969, from the heart of America, Swanson Health carries over 20,000 wellness products at a great value. Pick up all of your favorite health products, plus discover new ones for your wellness routine, all while leaving money in your pocket. If you want to try any of Swanson Health's great products for yourself, use code STARTUP20 for 20% off at swanson.com. We have a link there in the show notes if you listen to the replay on the podcast. It's time to be about that life. The Startup Life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career-minded professionals. You know, Startup Nation, as we move forward and as we engage through the reopening of our economy and things of that nature, we're trying to figure out how to navigate the uncertainty of it all, right? And today's guest is the perfect guest to kind of help us out with that. He is an award-winning chief executive officer and graduate of the University of New Hampshire. He's also the former chairman and CEO of Honeywell. And in 2018, in 2010, sorry, uh, he was selected by President Obama to be on the National Commission of Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. And he's also a Pats fan. We're going to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> he is my friend, David Cote. How's it going, David? Very well. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me on the show. All righty. All righty. And as always, as we ask all of our guests, are you ready to pour some knowledge into Startup Nation today? Because I definitely think you can help us out. I can't guarantee it'll be knowledge, but I'll certainly <laughs> have some words to answer whatever questions you ask. Fair enough. I'll, I'll, leave it to, I'll leave it to your listeners to decide whether it was of any use or not. <laughs> Fair enough. So if you would, David, j- just kind of share with us your origin story and your background of your career up until this point. Hmm, okay, this may take up the whole show. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in uh, New Hampshire in a small French Canadian enclave in uh, New Hampshire because it's where the textile mills were. And uh, back in those days, uh, French Canadians were the low cost labor that came in to run the textile mills. So I uh, spoke French before I spoke English. Okay. I spoke um, only French till I was about three years old. And my parents, my mom especially, focused me on uh, speaking English. And no, my French today is vestigial at best, so I can get by a little bit, but not much. Gotcha. I was the first to graduate in my family to graduate from high school. Mm-hmm. My dad had six months of high school. My mom had uh, two days, and she spent a year getting a secretarial degree so she could get a job. Okay. And there weren't a lot of role models, let's say, in the community. And in fact, my mom always used to say she wishes they'd been better able to advise me on things, even though... Uh, things seemed to turn out uh, okay at the end, but we had to kind of figure it out. I would say as I uh, grew up, I had great parents. And while I, I was maybe the first one to graduate from high school, the values that they were able to provide all five of us and the uh, kind of perspective about uh, take responsibility for yourself, think yeah. for yourself, all those sort of things, I think were just invaluable. And right. I've often been asked, uh, okay, who are your like leadership role models that you learn the most from. And I'll always point to my mom and dad and say all the stuff that they teach you as uh, a kid right. on how to think for yourself and so on. That They, they really were my uh, leadership role models. I, heard that. I was, um, we never had any money, of course, and neither did I. 
and that always bugged me. So as I became an adult, um, 18 or so, graduating from 17 when I graduated from high school, um, I was really, I had a lot of ambition, but I had a total lack of direction. So I had no idea how to channel it. And I had no money. Kept feeling like I needed to get somewhere, wanted to get somewhere, but had no idea how. So I, I was, I'd been accepted to the University of New Hampshire and I quit before I got there. Mm. Decided I was going to make a living as a mechanic and then as a carpenter's apprentice. And then I enlisted in the Navy and backed out the day before I was supposed to swear in. Got myself back into school. I uh, was in school for two years. And then I was called in front of the assistant dean of students office. And she said, I'd no longer be allowed to live on campus. And mm. I asked her why. And right. she said, because um, it was no one big thing, but wherever I was, there seemed to be trouble. I was just a general troublemaker. Gotcha. <laughs> and you could tell I'm still kind of proud of that. 40, <laughs> 40 or so years, 45 years later. Right. But I thought, okay, well, I'm tired of never having any money anyway. Uh, I'm going to get a job working nights and then I'm going to go to school during the day, which worked fine until I decided to buy a fishing boat with a buddy. And we were going to make our fortune commercial fishing, which uh, off the coast of Maine, which of course didn't happen. But I quit school again, got married, was living in this uninsulated, unheated third floor apartment in New Hampshire. So, yes, that's chilly up there. Right. And all of a sudden she tells me she's pregnant and can't work anymore. And I did the math and found out, oh, my God, I'm spending two bucks more a week than I take home from my job. Mm. I had a hundred bucks in the bank. So I figured, okay, I got 50 weeks to figure out what to do. Right. So I quit smoking cigarettes. I started working out. I started going, went back to school full-time during the day and worked full-time nights, managed to graduate, then got an exempt job at GE uh, in a, a finance role. And over the next 25 years, worked my way up through various uh, jobs at GE. I wasn't, so concerned about what I was doing as I was, did it pay more than the next, the last job I had? Because I, I just got really sick of every week trying to figure out which bills I could afford to pay and which I could afford to let slide and, uh, you know, wouldn't be a problem for me. Right. And it took me a while to finally get out of that hole and 25 years uh, into it at GE, Jack Welch, I was running the appliance business and right. he uh, had somebody call me to have dinner with him and, uh, that's where he fired me. So June of 99, he told me I'd no longer, uh, he wanted me out of the company by year end. Gotcha. And when I asked him what he had seen or not seen that caused him to make that decision, his voice just got louder and he said, <laughs> oh, no, I want you out of the company by year end. And I said, no, I get it. I'm a big boy. I just think I'm better than you think I am. If there's something I need to address, I'd like to know what it is. Right. And his voice got even louder. And he said, you don't understand. You have to be out by year end. If I said, okay, okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> I'll, right. I'll leave. So I went to TRW in, uh, I guess it was November of 99. I spent two and a half years there before I was recruited at Honeywell. And Honeywell was a bigger mess than anybody had ever right. thought or expected. And expectations of me were very low because... I was viewed as hadn't made it to the first tier of the GE succession race right? and wasn't even the first choice to run Honeywell, which was true. So what chances were that this company could ever be turned around? So it's kind of nice 16 years after that inauspicious beginning right? that uh, all the press has turned around on that. And they say, oh, you know, maybe he didn't do such a bad job after all. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and startup nation, he, he's being mild, you know, mild about that. You know, we're talking about taking it from a $20 billion company to a $120 billion uh, company is no small feat. So thank you for sharing that. I, I really appreciate that, David. Well, uh, there was a lot in there that I also skipped over. So I right. was doing my darn just to try to make it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I definitely <laughs> understand that. No, that, that, that works just fine. I really appreciate that. I, I want to ask a follow up because you talked about how, and, and I saw this in my prep, Well, you, you talked about how you weren't the first person uh, considered for the, the top job at, there at Honeywell. And also I saw that, you know, even CNBC, there was a few commentators that, that kind of kind of gave it to you a little bit saying that, you know, you're not ready for this and stuff like that. Let me ask you this. How do you fight through that noise to focus on the job at hand? Because because like you said, Honeywell was 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 not at his in his best shape at, by the time you took over the helm there. Yeah, and as bad as it looked externally, I can promise you it was even worse internally. I imagine. I'd say this is one where you just got to believe in yourself. And I knew 
I wasn't the first person the job had been offered to. Uh, I also got confirmation of that afterwards when I actually saw a letter from my predecessor to the board saying that a particular person uh, had rejected the position. So I knew it was true. But as I've tried to tell people, um, don't let your ego stand in the way of an opportunity. I hear that. And I've seen too many people who get hung up because they were the third person that it was offered to, or how could they offer it to that person instead of me first? And yeah, okay. I certainly understand the emotion. I felt some of that myself, but it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. When you look at something that way, and say, well, I'm going to spite myself just to spite them. Right. They're cutting off your nose to spite your face kind of thing. And right. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I think I can do something with this. So I'm going to take that job. Some people were watching uh, CNBC with me at the time right. when some of that commentary was going on. And they told me in retrospect, years later, they thought, sure, I was going to throw something at the screen because <laughs> it was so insulting. And uh, I can remember one of them saying, I watched you watching and I thought, "Uh oh, here it comes. And you'd been reading your paper and you put down your paper a little bit just so you could watch and see what they said. Then you went right back to reading your paper like nothing had happened. And she said, God, I thought, okay, this is a cool cucumber here. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> He's not letting this stuff bother him. And I didn't, I kind of viewed it as I'll show him. Fair enough. Now, interestingly, the people who said that, the one person in particular, doesn't even recall ever saying anything like that before <laughs> or ever having even thought it. It's funny how those things go around. It is I'm funny how that works. I'm the one that I think remembers it. Right. It is funny how, how those things work out. I appreciate you sharing that for sure. And Startup Nation, you know, forgive me, I need to do a quick reset. David is also the author of Winning Now, Winning Later, How Companies Can Succeed in the Short Term While Investing in and while investing for the long term, thanks to our great fan, friends at uh, Harper Collins Leadership for helping set up our conversation today. Uh, fantastic book, David. I really appreciate, you know, uh, going through it and reading it and stuff like that. A lot of uh, cool nuggets. One of the cool things I liked is when you talked about, you know, the the, the thing about short termism and, and things to learn from that. Kind of share with us your doctrine about short termism and, and how sometimes that can be a detriment. Sure. And uh I'm glad you like the book. I, I oftentimes said uh, most business books would make great pamphlets. They're <laughs> 10 pages of useful concept and then 250 pages of stories that just say the same thing over and over again. Got you. And I, I wanted to do something that was, let's say, uh, more substantive than that. So Absolutely. that every, every page, every other page had to have something. Right. It was useful. Right. So it's nice to know that we achieve that. Now, Absolutely. on the short term, long term, one of the things that bothered me was I kept reading about uh, the focus on short termism and how it was bad for business. And everything you read makes it sound like uh, it's mutually exclusive. You are either short term focused or mm, right. you are long term focused. And there's this fundamental principle that we ran Honeywell on, which was that success in anything was about achieving two seemingly conflicting things at the same time. Right. And I go through, do you want low inventory or great customer service? Do you want high margin rates and prices or do you want big volumes? Do you want uh, people closest to the action empowered for quick decisions or do you want to have good control so nothing bad happens? Well, in every case, you want both. And the same is true when it comes to short term, long term. You have to find a way to accomplish both and they go together. If you're not investing in the long term, eventually the long term becomes the short term and you right. find you're just out of gas. You've done none of the seed planting that you needed to in order to be successful out into the future. But the short term is important, too, because it's a validation of are you on the right path? So I always kind of, in other words, is your long-term direction, whatever you've selected, is it working and does it make sense? So I always felt the two went together and that's the way we tried to run Honeywell. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Trying to find that, that duality, that dual approach, uh, if you will, because, you know, I, I guess it's like anything else, you know, right? Like if you focus too far much on one side, the other side kind of, you know, falls to the wayside. So I, I, we're always preaching uh, to Startup Nation to find that balance. So I appreciate you sharing that. I'd say it's, um, I'm glad to hear you do that because I would say uh, 
it's not consistent with human nature. Human nature wants what's the one thing you want me to do, boss? So people have a tendency to think that way. And even if you, I don't know if you're, you might be too young to remember the movie City Slickers with Billy Crystal. Yeah, Billy Crystal yeah. and Jack Plants. And right. Jack Plants tells them it's just one thing. Figure out what that one thing is. Well, again, that's simplistic. It's never just one thing. Right. It's more than one thing. So we have to kind of, as leaders, start to always recognize that we're trying to accomplish two seemingly conflicting things. And it happens with everything. We'll say um, you want to cut staff costs. And you say, geez, you know, I want to cut the costs of finance, legal, HR, IT. Uh, you can cut those costs. But what's the thing the say the conflicting thing would be, and I expect service levels to stay the same or get better. Well, that kind of gets forgotten right. and people just start cutting costs. It happens everywhere in everything. And I'd say with every leader, it's important to remember. Same thing if you say, you know, the customer's always right. Right. Well, before you know it, you're doing some really stupid things because there are some <laughs> customers who will never stop asking right. for things and you've got to exercise some judgment. Right. So I think it's a very important principle. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And, you know, you, you're talking about how your book was a, a lot you know, different uh, than the other books. And I actually picked up on that. One of the things that I do love about, you know, books at HarperCollins, like a lot of the books at the end of the chapters, they have like these takeaway points if you will. And now you kind of have those, but yours are questions, which I think is in, you know valuable to the point where it focuses, the, it, it forces the reader to think about things, right? I mean, there's one thing Perfect. to like, you know, to, uh, you know, say, Hey, this is kind of the main points, but it's a whole nother thing to like read a chapter and then have these questions at the end to make you think about not just what you just read, but also juxtapose that to your experience and your journey. Talk about why that was important to have those questions at the end of each chapter, because I thought that was really cool. Well, I'm glad, boy, I'm glad you uh, liked that one, because that, that was uh, one of the things I really wanted to do. Gotcha. Uh, to your point, it's one thing to uh, summarize things. Right. It's another thing to try to frame it uh, in a way that causes the reader to have to think about what they've just read. And is there applicability of some of these principles uh, to whatever they're doing or to their business? And right. that's exactly what I was trying to do. So I very much appreciate that it came across that way, because, you know, if, if somebody comes away with 100 things they're going to do different, uh, well, it's, it's probably going to be too much. Right. But if in each of these chapters they can come away with saying, yeah, you know, that's something I ought to do. This question has caused me to think about that a bit more. Right. That's um, boy, that'd make me feel great. Gotcha. I hear that. And, and I really think it achieves that. I really do. And, and Startup Nation, that book is out today. Uh, and if you want to get, uh, you know, some extra content with it, if you text winning W I N N I N G to four, seven, four, seven, or visit winning now, winning com, you can receive free audio and video from David plus access to the first two chapters of the book winning now winning later i wanted to make sure we get that in there uh for startup nation to get that extra content as oh, well thank you sir no worries no worries so th there's a story in the book where you're talking about and, and I'm, I'm gonna i'm probably gonna butcher the name so forgive me but <laughs> I, I think it's onondaga lake yeah onondaga lake oh yeah. nailed it all right cool deal okay yeah, so, you got it uh, cool so you, you talk about this story and one of the things i got from this story is that like Maybe, you know, and, and basically Startup Nation, there were some issues with the lake. It needed some a massive cleanup. I think it took uh, just about, about uh, just over $450 million to kind of clean up and stuff like that. And I know in the story you were talking about how maybe it wasn't necessarily uh, a popular decision to clean up the book, clean up that lake, but it was the right decision for environmental purposes, for the purposes of the company and stuff like that. Kind of talk about, David, if you would about how 
when it's time to make tough decisions like that that are unpopular, but you know for a fact it's the right thing to do. Yeah, that is an interesting one to bring up because, um, as you might imagine, my finance team didn't think this was the greatest use of the company's resources. Right. Uh, we were a hundred year old chemical company. Every hundred year old chemical company is going to have environmental issues. Right. And my predecessors had viewed it as uh, you fight environmental issues in court until you lose. And then you pack. And I didn't like that that well. First of all, we had a lot of environmental issues because nobody, none of my predecessors had done anything about it. Uh, I also didn't think it was consistent with how I thought of myself. I'm, I'm old enough now to be a product of the 60s. And I said, ah, you know, I don't want to think of myself as somebody who does that and just doesn't address some of this stuff, whether I think the government is right or wrong in their policy here. Right. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, everybody's going to look to me and I'd rather have it be done. I didn't think it was consistent with the kind of products and services that we had as a company, which were largely around energy efficiency, ozone depletion, defense of the country. I mean, all really good stuff. Right. So that seemed inconsistent. I also didn't think it's how employees wanted to think of themselves or with the company. And lastly, I figured, look, these environmental issues aren't going to go away. They're more likely to become more expensive over time, not less. So this is actually better for the share owner. And I don't want to be the kind of leader who passes this problem on to my successor. Mm. I would rather pass on a clean company. Right. So I took a different approach and uh, hired. Uh, so Onondaga was a great example, but we did this around the country and spent three and a half billion dollars over 15 years to address all this stuff. At the same time, we were taking our market cap up as much as we did. Right. And uh, Onondaga was a great example. It was considered the most polluted lake in America. Right. Stuff that our predecessor companies had put in. It was used as an open sore by the city of Syracuse. So it was just a horrible mix of stuff in there. And People would talk about how they'd have to roll up their windows when they drove past it because it smells so badly. Mm. We took a different approach and started working with government. And you end up learning there's always somebody against you. So I, yeah. I did not <laughs> brag about any of our environmental progress until it was almost done. I was like 12 years into the 15-year plan or effort before I finally said anything externally, because it just mobilizes all the crazies for whom nothing is ever good enough if you're a company. And we kept it very quiet, but we got it done. And Onondaga went from that kind of lake to one where people swim in it now. And it's right. all approved for swimming, for fishing. And they're talking about putting beaches in again. So it's just a remarkable turnaround, one we're quite proud of. We went from being vilified by environmentalists to getting awards for our environmental performance. Huge change. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I want to ask a follow-up because there, there's something you said about not wanting to have this problem for future leaders of, of Honeywell, future uh, stakeholders of Honeywell and stuff like that. You know, it, it reminded me of in 2005 when President Bush actually read uh, the story about the, the Spanish flu. In 1918. And after he read that book, he wanted to put in, you know, things in place to, you know, kind of kind of avoid a pandemic or pandemic, you know, of that you know stature and stuff like that. And I'm not here to get political or anything like that. But I want to ask you this. When you were making that decision, was it about legacy? Was it about goodwill for Honeywell? Was it about, you know, just or just honestly, just just doing the right thing. Like I'm, I'm curious about those type of decisions because the thing is, like you know, there comes a point where like that's not even your responsibility anymore. So why Matt? Why does that matter? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, well, I would say uh, all three. Okay, things that you mentioned factored into it, and I can't say that I would say well this one more than the other because uh, they all kind of came together, but. I can say one of the things that drove me at Honeywell, and this was true even in my uh, succession plan, is I wanted to build an institution and I wanted to build something that 10 years after I was gone, people would still be saying, man, that is a great company. Okay. They, uh, uh, it keeps performing. You want to own that company. They just do great. So 
I wanted to make sure that whatever I did for succession, I picked a great leader, had the right portfolio, good process work, and that I'd set up the company as best I could at the time for success in the future. I think just based on Honeywell's performance in the couple of years I've been gone, most people would say that uh, we did that. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing it. And Startup Nation, that's why I wanted to ask that question, because I I think it's important, you know, and and this kind of goes back to that short term, long term type of, you know, duality and process, if you will. Right. Because I think as we as we go forth in our businesses on our entrepreneurial journey or even just in our career, I, I think a legacy matters. You know, you, you want to be, you know, what are you going to be remembered for? Right. You know, hopefully it's something that's great. And so when you're talking about a business, you know, you definitely have to think about like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or a hundred years from now, when I'm long gone, you know, you know, what do I be remembered for? And I think that's important for entrepreneurs to think about. So David, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Well, for me, legacy mattered in my professional life. Of course. And I'd have to say legacy matters in my personal life also. I've got two sons that I'm going to be, I'm very proud to see uh, kind of the legacy they're able to carry on, the values that I think I got from my mom and dad, which I'd like to think I've been able to pass on to them. And I watch them passing it on to their kids. And uh, that feels pretty, pretty good. Certainly as you get older, that idea of legacy uh, feels pretty good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. Once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to David Cote, the author of Winning Now, Winning Later. And if you want to purchase that book, Startup Nation, we have a re, uh, we have the link there in the show notes if you're listening to the replay on the podcast. Or also, you can go to winningnowwinninglater.com if you're listening to radio right now. Go ahead, uh, you know, and go to that website and go ahead and pick up a copy. I think you want to put this in your entrepreneurial toolkit, Startup Nation for Sure. I want to ask you one last question before we move forward about the book, because you talk about this story about you was reading this book and you were talking about uh, there's this concept that came up in about the rule of three minutes. Right. And so I I want to ask you about that, you know, kind of share with us a little bit about that, David, if you would. Sure. I uh, one of the things I tried to do in my job was uh, visit customers, employees, plants, around the world as much as I could to get a sense for what the hell was really going on. Of course. So I spent five or 600 hours a year on the plane. That's like 23 or 24 hour days, 23 days of it just on the plane. And one of the places I visited was Panama. And when I was visited the canal, they gave me a copy of a book about the Panama Panama canal. Right. And one of the things that struck me is for for one of the key engineers, I forget what his name was uh, on the canal used to talk about, his math teacher when he was in grammar school. So this would have been like in the 1870s or something. Right. And his math teacher told him, if you only have five minutes to solve a problem, spend the first three figuring out how you're going to do it. And I really liked that story because I'm a big believer in this Japanese phrase, go slow to go fast. Doesn't mean go slow to go slow. Right. What it does mean is whatever you're going to do, take time up front to make sure that the design is right, whether it's the design of how to solve a problem, how to build a house, how to develop a new product or a new service. But too often, uh, you can run into one of two extremes is people just analyze forever, can never get off the dime, right? or they are all buttholes and elbows from the beginning, (laughs) just trying to get into the action and, you know, got to do something. Right. And they haven't really taken the time to make sure that something is actually going to produce the results they're looking for. So I liked it because it was a good way of saying, uh, think about whatever it is uh, you're going to do. So I had shared this story with my aerospace business leader and his staff because I felt they were too action oriented, didn't put enough time into really thinking about stuff ahead of time, whether it was doing a pitch, trying to get a design done, whatever. So we were in the middle of looking at this acquisition. When we got to the end, and it was like a $500 million acquisition, Mm -hmm. I asked the leader in the team, all right, what do you guys think? Because you're going to be signing up for all this and you know I'll follow up with you to make sure that it actually worked the way we said it would. Do you want to do this deal? And various people on the team, you know, right away said, absolutely. Yes, definitely. And the leader of the business, a fellow named Tim Mahoney, uh, looked at me and said, I'd like to take my three minutes if you don't mind. 
And can I get back to you Monday? This was like on a Friday. I said, Absolutely. And I was quite encouraged by his response. So we get back together Monday and he says, yeah, I've had a chance to take a look at it. I think um, there's some other things we can do here now that I've had a chance to look at it. Right. And I want to proceed. Well, we did that deal for 500 million. About six months later, Tim landed an order that had not been counted on for $2.4 billion. Wow. So that deal paid for itself in a few months right. as opposed right. to years right? because he took his three minutes, really thought about it and figured out what it was he wanted to do and go after and then did it. So I'm a big believer in go slow to go fast, no matter what you do. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I, I think it's important in today's, you know, we're kind of in this golden ear of entrepreneurship. And a lot of times people are like, I got to do something. I got to do something. And a lot of times when you're just doing something, I mean, you end up looking like a rocking chair or like that flailing, you know, inflatable thing at car dealerships, right? It's like you're moving, but you're not really going anywhere, right? And, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you, you shared that story with us, David. I think that's an important one. Well, it's funny you uh, put it that way because when um, my buddy and I, uh, I quit school and we kept our night jobs, but we bought that fishing boat in Maine because that's how we were going to make our fortunes. Right. Uh, we had about as much money at the end of six months as we had when we started. And he got married and his wife basically said, you're not going to keep fishing with that idiot friend of yours, are you? <laughs> so we kind of got out of it. But I would ask, be asked by people, they'd say, wow, it must have been a great experience. And I'd say, oh, yeah, it was. I had a ball. They'd say, you must have learned a lot. I said, yeah, you know, actually I did. And they'd say, well, what was your biggest learning. So, you know, my biggest learning from that commercial fishing experience was that hard work doesn't always pay off. Mm. If you're working on the wrong thing, it does not matter how hard you work. It's never going to make a difference. So always try to make sure you're working on the right thing. Whatever it is you're doing, work on the right thing. And that's where taking that three minutes up front to really think things through can make a difference. All right, Startup Nation. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. We got to pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson and you're listening to The Startup Life. Support for The Startup Life is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Startup Nation, personal grooming is super important, not only from a hygiene standpoint, but also from a confidence one as well. And that is why you need to have a tight haircut and, well, a nice groomed undercarriage as well. And when doing that, you don't want to use the same razor, do you? That's just absurd. And this is why our friends at Manscaped have given you another option. Introducing the all new Lawnmower 3.0 by Manscaped. This lightweight and waterproof razor features precision engineered blades for safe trimming in sensitive areas and a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. Ladies, Father's Day is just around the corner and this will make a perfect gift for that guy on the go. Use code the Startup Life in all caps for 20% off and free shipping on your brand new Lawnmower 3.0 at manscaped.com. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you're listening to the replay on the podcast. And while you're there, be sure to check out all the other products from manscaped.com as well. So for proper manscaping without the fear of hurting anything, go with Manscaped. Trust me, your family of jewels will thank you. The Startup Life is powered by Ladder. Startup Nation, as an entrepreneur, you are the engine that powers your business. We have had many entrepreneurs on the show from those that played Division II basketball, quite a few Ironman participants, and even an NFL quarterback. And the one thing they all have in common is that they know getting early morning workout wins leads to business success for the day. However, it's super important what fuel you use for your workout to get that early morning success. And that's where Ladder comes in. Ladder is a sports nutrition company founded by LeBron James and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Unlike other supplements, every batch is tested by a third party that is trusted by all major professional sports organizations, including the NBA, NFL, MLB, and more to verify the highest standards for quality, but more importantly, safety. Ladder's goal is to help you unlock your best in any situation. Right now, that means access to special offers and expert advice from their community. Personally, I like superfood greens. Not only does it include the most essential nutrients that are hard to get in your diet, like magnesium, zinc, B vitamins, and vitamin D, 
They also included the Rodelio root, which helps keep you healthier when stress is high, but also it helps support immunity according to many studies. Use code BETTEREVERYDAY for 30% off everything site-wide at ladder.sport. That's better every day for 30% off at ladder.sport. So maybe you're not trying to be a four-time league MVP or a seven-time Mr. Olympia, but you still need the tools to elevate your health that elevates your business. So go with Ladder and prepare to get better every day. All right, Startup Nation, welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on The Startup Life. You know, Startup Nation, there, there are times where we implement a new system or a new strategy or something like that, and it goes right. And there are times where we, we, we implement it and it goes wrong or we do something where it's like, you know, we kind of have to, you know, kind of admit that, you know, maybe we took some missteps here. David, I want to ask you this because I was looking at, uh, you know, one of my favorite shows is Mad Money, you know, with Jim Cramer and stuff like that. You've been yeah. on there a few times and stuff like that. And I was looking at a clip from a few years ago where I guess you gave some guidance and, you know, uh, you know, about the company and stuff like that. And people didn't really resonate with it too well. Uh, and, and then, you know, you, you came back and, and kind of gave a broader view of the future and stuff like that. And you said that, you know, I was wrong for not painting a better 2017 outlook. How is it important is it to kind of like, you know, when you're in that leadership role, when you're in that role of like, you know, people looking to you and stuff like that, when you have like a misstep or a, a, a mischaracterization or something like that to kind of own up to that that part of that accountability piece. Kind of talk about that a little bit, if you would, David. Sure. First, I'd say I'm glad you like Mad Money. I'm a <laughs> huge fan of Jim Cramer's. Absolutely. And interestingly, uh, before I even knew him, and I'd only been at Honeywell about a year, and everybody externally, analysts, reporters, everybody was down on me because I they felt I was incompetent, didn't know what I was doing, et cetera. Right. Kramer was the one guy who publicly said, I think this guy has figured it out. So he was the one guy who was supportive uh, early on, long before anybody else was. I hear that. So I've always had a high admiration for Jim. And as you probably noticed, he's an endorser of my book also. Absolutely. I did. Which is uh, always nice. Right. Uh, but I think it's important in any organization for people at all levels to honestly and objectively be able to look at themselves and whatever they did and say that was good or that was bad. And here's why it went well or here's why it went badly. And if you want the organization to be able to do that so you can just have good candid, facts-based discussions about whatever it is you're doing. Right. Well, the leader needs to be able to do that too. And if you should have done something differently to get a better result, then you're better off letting the whole organization know that and just tell people, yep, uh, didn't do as well on that one. Nobody ever is a hundred percent. And this was one of my misses and here's what I'm doing to fix it. And I think that's just a much better dynamic for the entire organization. Cause if they can look at it and say, well, oh, geez, you know, the boss admits when he screws up, I should be able to do it myself. Big fact. You have yeah. a greater chance of that happening. Right. Thank you for sharing that. I, I appreciate that. You, you know, you know, as we you know move forward, uh, David, you know, obviously we're dealing with a world pandemic and there's a lot of small business owners that are, are not doing so great. Unfortunately, uh, many of them have closed and kind have closed for good. And so, you know, you, you took Honeywell to great heights, even during a recession. I mean, you said that when you first got there in uh, 2002, you know, there were things that were kind of, you know, go, it was not going so great. Uh, and, and then you got it on firmer ground, but even in 2008, there was another hurdle you had to jump over. So clearly, you know, Startup Nation, David knows how to get through, you know, uh, take a business <laughs> through uncertain times and things like that. What advice would you give small business owner, mid-sized business owners, large business owners, you know, as they engage through this, you know, this new, this new normal, this COVID-19 kind of economic depression a little bit, if you would? Yeah, I guess um, a couple of points. One would be don't panic. And okay. it's really kind of surprising how often leaders at all levels just kind of panic and start reacting. Right. As opposed to taking that three minutes to think about, okay, what do I have to do here? Right. And this is a time to take that three minutes to really think about what it is you want to do. Uh, the second one, and I maintain this is uh, true across the board, mm -hmm. big business, small business, government, nonprofits, everything. Uh, the ability to think independently 
is a lot more rare than being smart. You can run into lots of people who did well in school, explain to you how the herd is thinking about things, can analyze stuff, but they don't really think independently. And this is a time to, yeah, take all the input in, read the papers. But remember, papers, magazines, government, whatever they say, they all have an agenda that doesn't just revolve around doing the right thing for you. They've got their own point of view, papers, magazines, et cetera, want to sell more. Social media want you to read their stuff. Right. Government, whatever side they're on, they want you to think that they're the ones doing things right. Of course. So you have to take all this input and say, okay, what do I think makes sense for me? And that means being able to think independently. The other learning is probably too late at this point would be always make sure you have some kind of reservoir of cash or cash accessibility. Gotcha. Uh, Getting too extended, a little late to do it now, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, Always try to have some kind of cash reserve. Then the last piece I might mention is when you're in the middle of the recession, and trying to figure out how to survive, also be thinking about recovery. Okay. Because recovery does come. And there'll be all kinds of people predicting no recovery, strong recovery, middling recovery. And as I've liked to as I like to say about a lot of things, the one thing I do know is that no one else does know. Mm. So what what you want to do is be able to kind of plan yourself and say, okay, how do I make sure I'm still doing a great job for my customers so that they're still going to be there when I come back, that the delivery is there if that's what they need, the new products or new services I promise are still coming. But how do you make sure that you really have taken a good, taken good care of your customers? Because they're going to remember. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's very true. And I appreciate you sharing that, not, not just thinking about the right now, but the once again, there's that the short term, long term duality of it all. Right. Thinking about yep. the right now, but also thinking about the recovery. How do what do we look like coming out of this? And Startup Nation, th- those are some of the nuggets and more you're going to get when you pick up winning now, winning later. How companies can succeed in the short term while investing for the long term. Once again, we have a link there in the show notes to purchase that book. If you listen to the replay on the podcast, I want to ask you this, David, um, you know, as we start to slowly reopen the economy, uh, you know, back up to uh, consumers and small business owners and things of that nature, what's your commentary on that? You know, what's, what's a, a great approach? Are we, are we, are we going too fast here? Are we doing it very slow and measured, you know, what's your commentary? What do you think about what's going on with the reopening economy? Uh, well, so far from my perspective, it looks like it's going pretty well. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm in both uh, Georgia and Florida. Okay. And while people would say uh, they've opened up pretty rapidly, uh, one of the things that you do see is that uh, people are still being careful. I mean, they might be going to the grocery store, but they still wear masks. Right. They keep their distance and, it's like everybody understands, yeah, we're open. We can't keep living in sequester the way we have. Of course. But we're going to be smart about it. So Absolutely. to me, it feels like it is opening. Personally, maybe it's because I tend to be an optimist. I think it's going to work out better than uh, people think and gotcha. that the recovery is going to be better than uh, people think. But like I said, the one thing I do know is that no one else, including me, does know. Got you. Gotcha. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And, and in that same vein, we talked about how uh, you being a Pats fan uh, at the at the top of the show <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, I, I want to ask a Bill Belichick question in just a second. But before, you know, I get to that point, I want to ask you, because, you know, not only the economy reopening, we have sports. We're trying to get back to that that sense of normalcy where, you know, MLB is having negotiations with owners and players. And so is the NBA uh, thinking about, you know, um uh, having a plan to kind of play all their blame, their games at Walt Disney world, which just seems like kind of awesome. If you ask me, uh, but, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I want to ask you, you know, what's your commentary there as far as like, you know, not just sports, but just opening up. I mean, cause it's one thing to open up the economy, but the whole another thing to open up like the leisure part of our society. Right. You know, you know, do you take the same approach there as your open economy? Is it a little different? Kind of share your commentary with that if you would. Well, I'm a, uh... I'm not not an epidemiologist, so I, I can't uh, <laughs> I've got no medical uh, training here at all. Gotcha. I think they're smart, though, to avoid kind of the big venues where 
they get 100,000 or 20,000 people together in an enclosed space at one time right. until we're a little more confident about this. Because if there is any kind of relapse, then they're going to set themselves back for years. Right. So I think they're smarter doing it that way and taking their time. While at the same time, trying to have some kind of season so that all of us who are sports fans, especially if you're a Boston sports fan like I am, right, uh, kind of get our ongoing fix, whether it's what are the Patriots going to do this year? Do the Sox stand a chance? Can the Celtics get number 18? Can the Bruins get it on the board again this year? Right. Well, uh, I don't know. I just find that fun. And I like being able to talk about it with others, even though. Some would say it adds nothing to productivity of society. I would say maybe true, but I like it. (laughs) And I like talking to people about it. Gotcha. I I don't know about that. I think it does because I think, you know, you know, when we talked about balance earlier, I mean, true enough, you got to work and stuff like that. But I think, you know, when it comes to work, you need some time to enjoy the fruits of that labor. You know what I mean? So whether it's sports or anything like that, I think it, I personally think it, you know, produces to the you know, productivity so do, of, you know, so do I. Like that. Yeah. I, so do I. I can only promise you, not all my friends think that way and think that <laughs> sitting to watch a game is just an incredible waste of time. Gotcha. Uh, certainly, I like sitting there and watching the Patriots play every Sunday, for example. For sure. So for sure. I don't think I'm alone. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And in the same thing of the, of the Patriots, one, you know, I, I am not necessarily one who roots for uh, the Pats, but one person I do <laughs> definitely admire is Bill Belichick. And, and the reason is, is because it, it the way he runs the, the Patriots, you know, from, from the coach's perspective, right. It's, it's almost like one of the things he does well is that he puts people in a position to succeed, right? Like they know that they know their role. Everybody knows their role. They play their role very well right and what he also does is you know and I, and I think you know he you know maybe good or wrong or whatever the case may be he actually gets you know kind of releases people right before they kind of start to hit that decline so i want to ask you this you know could could bill belichick run a fortune 500 company oh i i'd say just based on his success uh you sure have to say he could right uh If he had started earlier in his career. Right. And I mean, the way I would describe it is uh, most people would say I was successful in business. I couldn't see me doing his job. Fair enough. And I think it's just uh, you develop an intuition instincts for whatever it is you're doing that you're successful in that really matter a lot. Uh, The thing I would add, though, to the. Uh, Belichick example, and I'm a huge fan also, as you might imagine, how could anybody not be right? But it's the, uh, everything that's around him. And you start with, uh, the Kraft family, for example, with Bob Kraft and his, uh, sons and the kind of environment they've created where Bill Belichick could thrive. Cause remember, right. Even the same guy didn't thrive in Cleveland. Exactly. Uh, so it didn't quite work for him there. Uh, Then you end up with a great quarterback, which makes a difference in uh, Tom Brady. We'll see how that goes this year. Right. But he did a great job of picking the right kinds of coaches around him and then focusing on getting the right kinds of players. So it ends up being uh, that the whole thing working together is what makes it successful. And it's the same thing we used to point at it. uh, Honeywell. uh, Okay, I may think I did a good job leading, but. I also uh, made sure I had great people. We uh, made sure we had great positions in good industries. We worked a lot on process so that the 130,000 employees we had all felt like they were a part of it and could contribute. Right. And it's like the whole machine working together is what generates the success. Right. I'm glad you pointed that out because, you know, you, you talked about the Cleveland example and it just, um, you know, just goes and goes to show that sometimes we're just not a great fit somewhere. And that works in you know career and business and stuff like that. Sometimes we, we like a, a general business and maybe that business just wasn't for us or maybe we're at a, at a, at a role somewhere and maybe we're just not a great fit, but we go somewhere and we flourish otherwise. And I appreciate you sharing that because I, I think, 
you know, I, I think what I admire about Bill Belichick is the system, like you just talked about, the system of the entire organization building a, a literally a championship uh, culture. And I appreciate you sharing that. Also, by the way, big Sox fan here, by the way. I do, I'm not, oh, okay. not, not a Pats fan. Do love the Sox, though. Do love the Sox. <laughs> so. Well, you're you're slowly moving in the right direction. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you there for all four teams eventually. Fair enough. Uh, Fair but just enough. to build on a point. Sure. Uh, made and kind of tying back into hard work doesn't always pay off right uh, one of the things that always kind of bothers me is when i hear these folks talking about stuff like altitude is limited by attitude and it's like as long as you have the right attitude you can accomplish anything gotcha which is absolute baloney okay it may make people feel better to say that i hear that but if they don't have a basic aptitude for something it's just not going to happen. I would love to be uh, be able to beat Usain Bolt in the 100 meter. <laughs> and I can work out 10 hours a day. I can uh, have a terrific attitude, eat all the right stuff, tell myself I'm going to kick his ass in the 100 meter. <laughs> and you know what? When he gets to the 100 meter mark, I'll be at the 50. <laughs> I just don't have it. Right. So it's important when you, you know, the motivational folks start all their altitude limited by attitude, just always start to think about, well, what about aptitude? Do I have the aptitude to be able to accomplish what I think is possible? Right. And getting back to your point, if you're wrong fit in a job or you say, okay, I really love this, but. I don't seem to be that good at it and I'm never going to make enough money to feed my family doing this. You better find something else. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. We're going to go ahead and start wrapping up with David Cote, former uh, chairman and CEO of Honeywell. David, what's your uh, superpower? We always ask this of all of our guests. What's your superpower and what you think has led to your, your business success? <laughs> I know it's a cheesy well, one. I, uh, I kind of joke with my uh, family and uh, tell them my secret power seems to be that I always know what other people should be doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, I say it tongue in cheek because that is some of what's required to be successful as a leader is to be able to look at all the organizations that are working for you and figure out what should they be doing that they're not, or what are they doing that I want to make sure they keep doing more of. Right. And those are insights as a leader that end up being very important to the success of the organization. But I like phrasing it the way I did, and they find it highly amusing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And Startup Nation, before I ask the last question, I just wanted to say, David, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. We really appreciated your insight, your value, uh, and, and the book that you we talked about today, Winning Now, Winning Later. Once again, Startup Nation, uh, you can uh, purchase that book. We have a link there in the show notes if you listen to the replay on the podcast. Also there in the show notes is a link to the Back to Business Leadership Summit. You know, David's going to be featured there with also two other previous guests of the Startup, startup Life, Adrian Banker and Blake Michelle Morgan. Now, uh, you're going to catch the replay because that's going to be between June 8th and June 12th, but you can catch the replay. We have a link there in the show notes as well to get that extra insight as you go forth on your path of entrepreneurship, especially given uh, these uncertain times that we're engaged in right now. So, David, I'm actually going to turn the microphone over to you because there's somebody out there in Startup Nation that's feeling a little down. They, they need a little encouragement, if you will. So if you would take us out with a few words of encouragement, if you would, please, sir. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for uh, it's been an honor to be on your show, and I appreciated all the questions. You made it uh, very interesting, and that's always uh, certainly fun for someone like me. I appreciate that. The uh, advice I would give to anybody listening, and I said this in the commencement address I gave at the University of New Hampshire about 10 years ago, which, by the way, NPR picked as one of the 350 best in 1774, which you could tell I'm obviously uh, proud of. Absolutely. But it's that most crises aren't Amen. and things generally do look better in the morning. So don't despair. Uh, sometimes, yes, a very bad thing will happen, but don't despair. 
instead pick yourself up and you have to be able to run again, whatever it is. And yeah, if you went bankrupt, I understand. It doesn't mean you don't get another chance. Things may look really tough right now. It doesn't mean that you're not going to come out of it okay. Just keep taking those right steps, believe in yourself, and just don't despair. Don't panic. Stay focused on what you can uh, uh, control and have faith in yourself. I hear that. Thank you so much. And that's going to wrap up our session here on The Startup Life. David, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for the invitation. It was fun. No worries. And as always, Startup Nation, if you have an idea, be about that life. The Startup Life. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, If you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.